Hi. I know someone's there. But anyway, look, with uh, it's not quite three, a couple of seconds. Uh, even if there's only a few people, that's fine. I mean, after yesterday, it was Daniel. Good to see you, buddy. I appreciate you coming every day. I've uh, got a really nice session today, really interesting. Um, at the end of the day, all I can really do is hope that, well, Salon, thanks for coming. All I can really hope is that what we do <clears throat> gives you something to think about. Uh, we do a bit of a sweat, have a bit of a session, uh, and then uh, we can focus on learning. Rochelle, good to see you all the way from Canada. Appreciate that. Uh, so today, you know, we're, we're, we'll have a warm-up. We'll do the deck of cards. We're nearly finished. Check this out. Almost done. Um, give it another shuffle. <coughs> and today we're, we're adding the seven of hearts and the seven of clubs. So that's seven push-ups and seven squats. I'll try to put them in kind of evenly somewhere. Um, that should do it. We're almost done. We we actually have only five cards to go when we've got the full debt. So Clarence, us all the way from South Africa, Graham, Karate Croft, us. You have to tell me your name, Rob from from uh, Tassie, and Mike from Tassie via Perth, us. Good to see you, Mike Clark. Uh, Mike's been with us a couple of times, and uh, if you have a look at, back at a couple of the uh, a couple of sessions ago, I. I put a link to Mike's book. Mike Clark has written this fantastic book called Shin Gi Tai. And it's funny, I've got on my list of things to do today, I want to talk about Shin Gi Tai as well. Um, there are so many different very, uh, interpretations. <laughs> Excuse me, just a peanut. Uh, Frederick from Sweden, wonderful. Good to see you. Vin from India. Chrissy, Chrissy Dunn. I wonder the kids there. If so, say hi to Maeve and Estelle and Freddie for me, and uh, we'll get going. So we'll have a bit of a warm up. We'll go straight into the deck of cards. Uh, I want to look at the shuto, and one of the things I want to look at with shuto is not only how you hold your hand because it's very, very uh, important um, to get the hand shape right, but also the incredible impact that you can generate. Uh, with the knife hand and you know it's understandable why really advanced uh, masters of martial arts don't like to use their karate I mean it's quite common for a very advanced karate person to find themselves in a situation and as much as it sounds strange they'd rather just go up and take the blows than hit back because they're sometimes quite <clears throat> afraid of the damage they can do now I know this is uh, always a point of contention. I can remember in the 1980 national championships, we had a fellow who was a national champion in his own martial art. Um, it wasn't Kyokushin. It wasn't. It was a different martial art, similar to karate. But he was the lightweight champion of Australia, and he entered in the lightweight and the middleweight divisions because he was right on the border and. He figured he would do both the lightweight and the middleweight. And when he was sitting in the change room before the event, he was looking a little dejected. And one of my instructors, actually, Brian Ellison, said, are you okay? He says, I'm a little worried. He says, well, why is that? He said, well, they told me I'm not allowed to wear shin pads. He said, well, why is that a problem? He said, I'm quite concerned if I kick these guys, I'm going to knock them out and, and kill them. And I don't know what to do. And Brian said, buddy, just go out there and do your best and really, really try hard uh, because it's not what you think. So, there, of course, there are people who have this um, inflated opinion of the strength of their techniques, but there are also people out there who genuinely do understand the incredible impact that... Uh, their art can have. And when I think about shuto, and particularly shuto on the neck, you know, I don't know if there are any cricket fans out there, 
But, you know, over the years, a number of cricketers have died. And I'm, I don't know about baseball because baseball is a North American thing. But, you know, a, a good baseball pitcher can pitch that ball at 100 miles an hour, 160 Ks. And that's what a good cricket ball travels at too. Us Raj from um, and uh, I think it was that um, South African, Darren Randall. Uh, and then you had Lamba from India. And then you had uh, Abdul Aziz from Pakistan. And all four of those guys died from being hit in the neck by a cricket ball. Now, a cricket ball is travelling at 100 miles an hour, 160 kilometres an hour. We know that for them to throw a cricket ball or a baseball 160 kilometres an hour, it has to generate off about the same speed with the hand. Well, if you have a trained hand and you're hitting at 160 kilometres an hour on someone's neck, it's not surprised that not only do you knock them out, that you, you almost kill them. So we need to uh, understand, first of all, um, how we need, and you may notice I never use the word maximal power. It's one thing to generate maximal power. It's another to generate optimal power. How do I interpret the difference? Well, the difference is are you still in control of your balance, timing, and coordination when you hit? Because you can hit with maximal power but if you miss you lose complete control on the other hand you can hit with optimal power and that allows you to hit maximally while still in control of everything else and that's a very important distinction optimal as opposed to maximal okay and so when we're dealing with um uh shoot door techniques particularly to the neck and tetsui is also another form of shoot door shoot door is just this with your hands closed tetsui is that with your hand i mean with your hand open tetsui is just that with your hand closed okay and i've known people with your hand and it hardens everything up well if you do a good good um uh, shuto, you shouldn't need to do that okay so we, we um want to look at shuto and we want to combine that maybe with i'm thinking of uh, just as i was walking downstairs thinking of pin and two and an application out of pin and two you know there are 50,000 different ways to do different techniques. One, some style goes like this, another one goes like this, another one goes, you know, and then it's all varied. But the point is, as long as you have an application in mind, that application is good. And for me, one principle that I'm always looking for during applications out of techniques is um, the push-pull principle. You know, the hikite is a pulling movement. And when you, you the other day we were practising the multiple techniques of one hand with the hikite remaining where it is. But if you combine the hikite, particularly when you grab hold of someone's arm and pull that arm and strike out like that. So we want to look at that as well um, and uh, have a bit of fun with that. Let's see. We've got uh, Harry. Welcome from down the hill. Richard. Us. Richard Kimura from Hawaii. Graham Rose. For those who don't know Graham Rose, he's been around an awful long time. He's one of Australia's tournament legends. Uh, good to see you. And uh, Graham's been keeping up with the deck of cards. He and I were talking about how the deck of cards is that we do is the best best form of online gambling in the world because everybody wins. And uh, Shay and Nate, good to see you. Shay and Nate, the students up here, have been training with me up here at the mountain since we opened. Uh, and I'm hoping that Ren and Shin are there. I'm thinking maybe James and uh, Maddie and even Josh and Bell. Uh, a lot of people, can't, but they can't actually leave a message because they don't have an account at uh, at YouTube. Okay, so let's get going. We'll have a warm up at a card, the deck of cards. We'll go in looking at shoot though, a, a pin and two application. I want to look at hopefully um, uh, Pareto's law. We'll discuss Pareto's law and how we can apply that and different ways that we can train alone at home. And that's where I wanted to bring in the Shin Gi Tai concept uh three different ways three different areas of training that we have to address when we're training solo at home and how can we do that okay so let's get going i'll take this deck of cards it's getting up there oh boy who did it yesterday yesterday was probably the hardest one so far because we added we've started to add the final tough uh, hearts the burpees so let me just make sure that this is all in line here
How's that? Can you see me there? Yes, beautiful. Thank you. Okay, we'll have a warm up, then a deck of cards. I'm just checking who's there. Daniel, again, good to see you, buddy. You've been reading, he's been reading Mike Clark's book. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, and it's great to have Mike Clark uh, as a guest here today as well. Um, okay, there's a deck of cards. I'll leave that for now. I opened the door to the most beautiful breeze blowing through there. So there's a deck of cards, my boards. And let's start a warm up. Okay, nice and easy. Knees, itch, knee. So if you're young and fit, you just push it. Hunter, the other way, itch, knee, sun, she, squatting, itch, knee, sun, she. Remember, let gravity do the work. Itch, knee. Here, if you can squat down, drop your hips low, your head high, push the spine nice and straight, push your hands down, and legs straight. If you can only reach your knees, that doesn't matter. That's fine. When I first started training, that's just, that's all I could do. Gradually, you work your way down. Mind you, genetics plays a lot of it too. Squatting again. Get the lower back stretch out. The thighs, the hips, and let the arms dangle. Work your feet apart. And twisting it. Me, sun, she, go, look, itch, touch, go, do, down the middle, itch, me, sun, me, me, sun, sun, pull the right, itch. And left. Middle, hold both feet, and pull your head downwards. Good. Adjust your length and bend the right leg. Try to keep the heels on the ground. Once again here, Slide your knees and let gravity do the work for you. Just relax. With every breath out, just relax. Remember Tohei's four principles of relaxation. Extend your energy. Keep the weight under side. Relax completely. And keep the thought, the energy at the lower core. And each of those will help you relax a little bit more. See? Hip flexor, push it forward. Wish you could see the view here. I'm looking out over a forest. It's really lovely. And it's a beautiful, cool day too. It's almost uh, winter in Australia. Mind you, winter here is nothing like winter in Canada, where Rochelle is. Try to get the calf on the ground. Try to open up, find your balance. Other side. Nice and relaxed. Let gravity do the work. I love this stretch. You do it anywhere, anytime. I've done this in airports. I've done it on airplanes. I've done it in hotel rooms. It just helps everything relax. Neat. I'm just going to come forward a little bit there. Flexor. And some. Nice and relaxed. Leg straight again. 
pull down. Shiko Dutch. Nice deep Shiko with your thumbs forward on your thighs, not back. Thumbs forward so your elbows are in. Pushing one shoulder forward with your arm. And switch the other side forward with the arm. Nice and deep, both arms down. This is also a really brilliant stretch to uh, use even when you're on the road, don't have anywhere to train. You can do this next to your bed in a hotel room or even in the hallway. Okay, and you can do the, sh the sumo stretch as well, the shiko bumi one. I have to be careful with my knee with this one. Once I do a couple, it seems to find its groove. Just to get close to easing some of the uh, COVID-19 restrictions and isolation in my home state, they're talking about some changes coming up from the 1st of May, so that's a good sign. I have to say, I think Australia's handled the whole situation extremely well, and per capita, in terms of uh, active cases, we're probably one of the best in the world, uh, particularly countries which have a large tourist movement, which was the original uh, social contact problems that we had. So when that restriction stops, I'll be able to grab one of my students and work on some two-man drills, two-man bunkai, and some applications. I'll grab a young student too so they can do the things that I can't do. Do it. Knee. Nice and easy, stay relaxed. Sun to the left. She to the right. If you don't know what she is, a great way to learn it. Not a shoulders, it's me, son, aren't they? It's so let's just spend a couple of minutes doing the yoga stretch. So remember, when you breathe, when you open or stretch up, breathe in. When you close, stretch down. It's that simple. But I'll, I'll talk the breath through anyway. Okay, feet together. Stand nice and straight, shoulders back. And... How's that if I come about there? And breathe in. Out. In. Hold. Out. In. Out. Breathe softly, use your Ujjayi warrior breathing, turn your elbows in so your arms don't pop out, and lengthen the distance from your hands to your hips. Just keep lengthening, lengthening, lengthening. Doesn't matter if your heels are on the ground or not. Breathe in. Out. In. Out. 
In. Hold. Up. In. Out. Relax into the position. Elbows turn in. Lengthen from hand to hip. Breathe in. Forward, out. In. Out. Last one. In. Out. In. Hold. Up. In. Up. Push your hips away from your hands. In. Out. In, out. Nice, that's a really brilliant stretch. That pretty well stretches every muscle in your body. That breeze is blowing in some leaves. Could be worse, could be something else. But yeah, that's a great stretch to do. Just do a few of them. Uh, as we move on in time, I'll add on the second part of it too. That's part A, there's also a part B. We can do that too, and that's really uh, good for stretching as well. Okay, let's move on. Enough procrastination. Got this deck of cards I've got to deal with now. You don't need the boards, it's up to you. I like to use the boards because I'm, my hands are getting soft because I've been using the, uh, jigsaw mats. Okay, deck of cards. Let's go. First card up Queen, Spades. Well, push ups. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Take your time. Three of hearts. Three is good. I wouldn't mind being the last heart, not the first. I like to get the big ones out of the way, but it doesn't always work like that. Ready. Pitch. Three. Sun, king, diamonds, 13 sit-ups. That's it, sun, shit, oh, go, it's, watch, go, go, it's, hit, sun. There's a good, uh, we'll work on that pendulum. Eight diamonds. Stay there. <laughs> Eight sit ups. Itch, neck, tongue, chip, look, look, pitch, heart. Jack, club. So 11, uh, 11 uh, squats. Remember when you get up, no hands. So you lose the pen, you'll use the pendulum and the hip push. Pendulum up, hip push forward. Jack squats, uh, 11 squats. Mitch, mid, sun, chip, go, look, pitch, touch, good, good, edge. Next one, five of clubs. Ready, itch, mid, sun, chip, go. Next one, hope you're joining in because, uh, It'll make a difference. You can't get fit by uh, osmosis. You have to do it yourself. Ten of clubs. So ten more squats now. Pitch, net, sun, shape, go, 
Look, remember when we finish the deck, we do a hundred of each. Two, two. A full deck is a hundred push-ups, sit-ups, squats, and burpees. That's a really good daily workout. I spoke and it came out. Ten burpees. Okay, take your time, remember. If you can't keep up, rest. The trick is to get to the full deck. Then you increase the intensity. Itch. Knee. Sun. Shape. Go. Look. Itch. Punch. Coop. Go. <clears throat> Ten burpees. Next, nine spades. I always find push ups harder after the burpees. Two clubs. <clears throat> Pitch me. King spades. 13 push ups. Me. One. He. Oh. Look. Pitch. Hux. Hoop. Hoop. Pitch. Me. Some. 10 diamonds. 10 sit ups. Go at your own pace. If you can't keep up, that's fine. The trick is when I finish, you finish also. So if I do 10 sit-ups and you can only do one, you won't be able to keep up. So whenever I finish, you finish. Unless, of course, you're finishing before me. You can do a couple extras if you want. Bitch, me, son, she, go, look, bitch, bitch, go, do. Next one, king clubs. Once again, from sitting to standing, no hands. Use your pendulum and your hip push. Pendulum up and hip push forward. 13 squats, king of clubs. Mitch, me, son, she, go, look, pitch, hutch, hoop, hoop, pitch, me, son. Two push ups. Pitch, knee. Queen, diamonds. 12 sit ups. Pitch, knee. Sun, knee. Go. Look. Pitch. Punch. Yup. Yup. Pitch. Knee. Not seeing a lot of hearts. Every time I say that, the next three cards are hearts. But this one is seven of spades, seven push-ups. If you go to push-ups in this position, once again, use the push and momentum. Roll forward, let the legs tuck underneath. Pitch, me, thumb, chi, go, look, and shit. Next one, five spades. Next one. Eight hearts. Here come the hearts. Ten burpees. Ready. Pitch. Knee. Sun. She. Go. Walk. Pitch. Punch. Don't forget to share the link. Cool. Yeah. Share the link, let everyone know. The number of subscribers doesn't really help. That's great. But also copy and paste the link and send it to your friends on Facebook and things. I'd really appreciate that. Eight clubs. Eight squats. Pitch. Mid. Sun, shape, 
Go. Go. Hitch. Hodge. Four. Hops. One more burpees. Hitch. Nick. Sun. She. And next one. Eight spades. Eight push ups. Hitch. Hitch. Hearts. Next one. Jack diamonds. Eleven sit ups. Hitch. Hitch. Sun. She, go, hook, hit, hutch, go, go, hit. Three clubs. So we need to sit forward from here, cross your legs, and rock your weight forward, and let the legs go behind. Hitch, knee, sun. I'm sorry, that was three clubs. <laughs> My bad. Three squats, not three push ups. Hitch, knee, sun. So we're doing extra push ups. Jack, spade. Hitch, knee, sun, hey, go, look, hitch, hut, kill, kill, hitch. Next one, ace, diamonds. So 10 sit ups. Hitch, hip, sun, hip, go, hook, hitch, hutch, go, go. Waiting for those big hearts to pop up. Haven't seen any yet. That's uh, two of diamonds. Two more sit ups. Easy peasy. Hitch, knee. Also, haven't seen the, uh, the uh, shadow spine. Here we go, here they come. Jack of hearts, so 11 burpees. I think that's still the biggest one in the day. Nip. Sun. She. Go. Look. Hitch, hutch, kip, kip, hitch, eleven, good. Next card, four spades. I think every time I've had a burpee, I've had a push up card after it today. Four of spades. Hitch, he, son, she. Next one. Ten more push ups. Back to back, straight off the burpees, always a toppy. Ready, hitch, he, son, he, go, look, hitch, hutch, cute, you are. Yep, getting tough. Joker, whoa. Nice timing, that joker. Okay, so always ask yourself what's my objective? of this round for shadow is it balance having my weight on the left for left my weight on the right for right is it coordination having the arcs of tension through the body is it the flow of techniques based on that coordination with me which means nice rhythm like a metronome ba, 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 ba. Explosion of the reflex. I don't have a, I don't have any, uh, uh, what do they call it? Any pads between my knees, so I can't feel this sort of thing. Bam! Move off like that, switch, and long. Defense two. Boom, defend, 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 defend. I might talk a little bit about defense later on if we have time. Boom. I might go a little over today too, so I hope you don't mind. Four diamonds, four sit-ups. Hitch, knee, sun, 
Gee, give me my cow. I've got sweat dripping in my eyes. Six hearts. So again, from here to stand up, pendulum the legs, push the hips. Pendulum, push. Six. Let's go. Okay. Remember when burpee, a six burpee was the biggest card? So now it's a good small one for us. Shape, so the body's adapting. Go. Go. This is day 30. So it's been a month since we started. We've only got a few to go. Nine burpees back to back. We can do this. Ready. Pitch. Me. Sun. Shape. Go. Go. Hitch. Hutch. Go. See, when it's not a race, you can do it. Just put one foot in front of the other. Over the years, I ran about 10 marathons, 10 full marathons. I used to run them in my gi. Get some funny comments. The point I'm making is I'm not a marathon runner. I'm not a good runner by any means. But my theory was I just keep putting one step in front of the other. Well, it's the same with the cards. You'll always finish if you keep moving forward. Seven clubs. Glad that wasn't hard. Seven squats. Pitch. Big. Tongue. Cheap, look, look, pitch, seven, good. Next one, three, diamonds, pitch, knee, sun, three sit-ups. Hip, sun, hip, look, look, pitch, touch, go. Eight, hearts. Again, standing up from here. And remember when I talk about the pendulum leg movement, it doesn't necessarily have to be a straight leg like that. That can be dangerous if someone's trying to take your space on the ground. You lift your leg, they push the leg, and you're stuck. What you can do is you can do a kakato kick, like kakato roshi. You're kicking like that. So instead of going like this, you go like that, you still get the same pendulum effect. And hips up. So what do we got? Eight burpees. Boy, oh boy. Pitch. Big. Sun. She. Go. Look. Pitch. Uh, tomorrow morning too, tomorrow morning 9 a.m. So that's uh, not sure what that is. You can look it up, 9 a.m. Queensland, Australia. Uh, Tom Callahan, Chian Tom Callahan in America is doing a live session. He's a fantastic instructor. I'll put the link in the bottom as well. So if you can, you might want to get along and uh, join in there. Queen. Clubs, 12 squats. We're getting to the lower third of the deck now. One, two, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Five diamonds. Bitch, me, some, she, go. Three spades. So three. Push ups. Itch, knee, sun. Remember, the only time you really want your hands to touch the mat is in the push ups. Otherwise, try to develop the habit of getting up without using your hands. If you do it during the cards, it will become very natural. Next one seven diamonds. Itch, knee, sun, she, go, rock, and Stand, pendulum, hip push, pendulum, 
hip push. The more you do it, the easier it gets. So, five burpees. Ready. Itch. Knee. Sun. If you're young, you can jump there. I've got no knee, I can't jump. Hit. Low. Nice one. Nine. Clubs. Itch. Hit. Sun, keep your back as straight as you can. Go up. Hook. Itch. I touch my hands to the ground. Good. That reminds me to go all the way. Joker. We'll take that. Shadow spa. Nice and relaxed. Think rhythm. Up on the heel for the right. Don't twist. Twist. Go straight. Straight. Superman punch is really good to defend the thigh kick. They can punch straight away. That uh, is a really good practical application. And it's also a good fake kick over the top. You can practice that Superman punch as well. Work on bridging the gap. Work your footwork. Footwork is very taxing because it uses the alactic system. So I don't use it so much in shadow during the deck of cards because I'm trying to get my breath back, not burn it up. Rhythm, bang, bang. That'll do before I burn myself out. What do we got? Ace, spade, so that's 10 push-ups. Let's be, Tom, be, go, go, he's hot, kill, kill. Next one. Whoa. I hope that's the last big heart. I haven't been counting. Seven of hearts. Let's do this. We got it. We all work together. Nice lad, Kiai. Us. Rasha. Let's go. Itch. Nip. Sun. She. Go. Look. Itch. Nice. A few more cards. Whoa, another burpee. Two. Two's not so bad. Itch. Knee. Push. Next one. Ace. Clubs. Ten squats. Itch. Me, son, she, go, look, hitch, hutch, kill, do. And lucky last card. Whoa. Love finishing on a small one. Four of clubs. Ready, hitch, ding, son, she. Well done. Grab a drink. Where's my towel? That was That was great work, everyone. Paddy's here. Good on you, Paddy. The bunker, right all the way from Japan. Arigato gozaimasu. And the kick you just demonstrated as Kakato was the kick that I was asking about. Good, yeah. So Harry was talking about from that ground position. Is it dangerous? I interpreted what he said as is it dangerous to get kicked from above? Well. It kind of is, but it's even, in my opinion, even more dangerous to get kicked from below. In a real fight, I'd say the benefit is with the guy on top because of gravity. In a controlled fight, 
And you know, you could argue that ground fighting UFC has one of the strictest rule sets, one of the freest rule sets, but there's a couple of interesting things which they have. And one is that the kick from the ground up is allowed, but the kick from up to the ground is not allowed to the head and body, so the kakato, you know, that oroshi. So there's argument in UFC, particularly if you're in the referee circles, whether that it gives one fighter for the moment he's on the ground the opportunity to attack in a way that the other fighter can't. That's never a fair thing. But that's their rule, so the fighters live with it. Tomorrow, we only have five cards left. Tomorrow, we add the Queen of Hearts and the Six of Clubs. Okay, so the Queen of Hearts is 12 burpees. That's a beauty. We'll put it right there with that deck. We'll shuffle them up tomorrow, and away we go. Okay, doke. So, well done. Um, that deck, I think you'll agree, is getting tough. And it's like basics. I know people have said to me, well, I just go through all the basics. It's just so easy. Yet I've known national champions who are super fit, who are blowing up after just four or five techniques. And the difference isn't that he's less fit. The difference is that they're applying more focused and harder as easy as you want. My suggestion is as you get older, your priority becomes protecting your body against injury. The number one rule at all times is to go home without an injury so that tomorrow's training can be the best it can be. Uh, so that means you have to uh, mind the intensity of your training. You have to build up very slowly. So if you look at that Makiwara video that I did, I talk about building up, starting with just five techniques of each, building it all the way up to where you're going to 100. Well, it takes a long time to get there if you want to protect yourself from injury. If you don't care about injury and you're a little bit haywire, well, then sure, smash it. Do 100 the first day of every technique. I guarantee in a week you'll be resting injuries and you won't be able to train for three months. Injuries are a fool's game. Some people say that injuries are a consequence of the gaunt necessarily prevent uh, accidents in tournaments and so on. But generally speaking, 90%, I'd say, of injuries, you can sort them out yourself. Okay, we might go a little bit over today. The other value of such training, of course, is how you're training your mind and attitude. Well, that's the thing, too. Uh, as Mike says, Shingi Tai means the mind, the technique, and the body. And a lot of people focus on the body. When you're young, you could probably go Shingi Tai uh, 20, 30, 50% working on the body and the hardness. and uh, But as you get older, that ratio changes and the importance of recovery. As Graham, you have a look there, Graham Rose left a note. You know, uh, people underestimate the importance of recovery because most of your gaining, your training gain happens during the recovery phase. So you need to rest. Even the Uchi Deshi that I Uh, who I think probably trained as hard as anyone in the country. If, if not harder, I knew I, we had guys who want to come in and join in the Deshi for a while, and they literally on the first or second day say this is insane. But the guys always manage their intensity, always manage their recovery, and uh, I would say virtually without exception, all of them got through their whole Uchideshi, years of Uchideshi training with virtually no, if at all, virtually no injury. And that comes down to... Uh, managing the intensity and the rest, okay? So um, I wanted to move on a little bit. I wanted to look at Shuto and uh, play with that a little bit. So we'll do a couple of Shuto techniques and also think about it in terms of the Tetsui. And remember, Shuto is just a Tetsui open. So there's your Tetsui. That's your Tetsui there on the bottom of your hand. You squeeze the fist tight and the Tetsui is right. People will teach you to do Tetsui in different shapes, okay? 100% fine. If you want to do it whatever way you want, it's up to you. But listen to your body. And uh, as you do the uh, technique over time, feel the effect of it, particularly when you feel it against a very hard surface. If your hand is flat, straight like that for knife hand, my experience is you always get injured. What you need to do is relax the hand a little bit so that when you hit, you can tighten on impact. Just like when you throw a punch, you tighten on impact. Well, the knife hand's the same. Also, you don't want your fingers back to back. Okay, this is interesting. You don't want your fingers back to back for two reasons. 
One is if you hit with a knife hand and your fingers next to each other, you get a ricochet. Anyone who's done a lot of boards with the knife hand like that, you start to get damage to the knuckles here. And I have one arthritic knuckle. You see that horrible thing there? And that's primarily because of my little finger hitting it when I do breaks. So the best way to do a knife hand is with your fingers staggered. There's two reasons. The first reason is when you hit, no finger bumps into the finger before it. Two, with your little finger a little further bent than the others, you can harden the knife hand better. And three, if you use the fingertips like nukite in the eyes, and this is, again, a good place to look at the best techniques to use in the street is look at the rules of something like UFC and the techniques that are not legal. In UFC, you can't even shape up with your fingers pointing towards your partner's eyes. You can't even shape up like that. In Kyokushin, we can. They can't do that. The referee will go, stop, either get your fingers, cl hands closed or drop your hand. But you can't have one of the best street fighting techniques in the world is a finger in the eye. It's that simple. Now, if your hand is straight and you rake your fingers across the eye, we have a very, very small margin of error. Look, there. It has to get through there. But if it's like that, you have that much margin of error. Okay, so when you rake your fingers across the eye, you stagger your fingers like that. You go, I don't want trouble. And then you reach out with your staggered fingers, go one way and the other, and you make them get that reaction. And that's a very, very good setup for a follow up uh, groin kick or bladder kick or even front kick if you've got nice heavy boots on. Okay, so you stagger your fingers across. It's the same when you do knife hand. Okay, so I wanted to particularly look, I'm running out of time, but I'm going to actually go over a little bit today. If you can't stay, I understand, but I'm going to probably go over 10 minutes or so because I want to cover this uh, This uh, problem with Carter is as you get older, the big deep stances are impossible, you hurt your knees. So what you can do is shorten the stances, give yourself a solid base, but then work on optimizing the uh, quality of your upper body technique. So... In kata that have long stances, zenkutsu and kiba and so on, I know that we can't do those long stances after a certain point, especially if you've got a few um, accumulated uh, damage problems with your knees and so on. So shorten the stance. So what I'll do often when I'm practicing uh, pinan 2, for example, on my own, is I'll shorten that kiba into a, a yoi or fudo dachi, and it allows me with such balance and such power. So let's look at that now, pinan 2. So the movement is from here and there, okay? One. One of the things I work on in the dojo is that I never work on the idea of multiple attacks. I look at a kata, and if you want to do that, that's fine. Again, anything I say, um, please don't hold it against me. It's just my preference. And after 50 years, I'm allowed to have a preference, even though I stick very much to the loyalty towards soul size teachings. So when I have a preference, it's what it is is I've looked deeply into soul size teachings and I've tried to interpret in a way that makes sense. I don't go, well, that doesn't make sense. I know there are groups now. Some groups actually change the technique for the sake of change. They just change because they want to appear different and they want they, they, their idea is that, well, let's move on from soul side. Let's take the photo of soul side down and put his photo up instead. That sort of thing's not in my brain. Um, so they'll change the technique. So if you can imagine, you're throwing the technique at me. What do I do? I don't know what you're going to throw. I can say to you, throw a head punch. And if you throw a right head punch, I can just go like that every time and you'll miss. Throw a left jab. I just go like that and you'll miss. But if I say throw anything you can, try and knock me out with it, well, then my intensity changes dramatically. So that's the question to ask. Will this technique work against a non-compliant opponent whose objective is to hurt me? Well, if that guy's in front of you and he's going to come charging in, what are you going to do? This technique is perfect because what happens is <clears throat> you connect your hands. You're doing like NK Gyakuski, Mawashi Geri, Shito Mawashi, but you're doing it in Pinan too, and you're moving <clears throat> off to the side. So it's not like I'm here and someone attacks me from here and I turn. Okay. The danger was there and they get that close and they can attack you and you're not even facing them, well then, I'm sorry, but you're a little slow with the game, okay? You should be more aware environmentally than that. 
My theory is I've turned to face him. And as he attacks, I'm moving off to the side and defending that way. So what do you do? You always get out of the line of fire. Even when you're sparring in, in tournaments, you're, you're constantly moving to get out of their dead zone. Boom, bang, boom. Okay, well, we're doing the same thing in a kata. I'm here. He attacks straight into me, and I move off to the side. As hands coming together will block virtually everything. Now, here's where the push-pull and the tetsui come shuto work. The second technique is we come here, I go here, and then I step into kiba. Well, I can't do kiba anymore. So what I do is I'll keep it there. I'll step off to the side, back there. In the kata, we step out with that. Okay, I step off to the side, and then I go from here, and look, I'm going to grab that arm, his arm. He might have been trying to punch. I've blocked there. I've come under here, I've grabbed that arm. Now you can imagine if I have that wrist and his arm is always connected to his neck. Now remember, cricket players and baseball players die when that ball hits them in the neck. It doesn't take much to knock someone out on the carotid signs. So I've come here, I've moved off to the side. There's my pin and two movement. I don't want trouble. Boom! I move off to the side as they attack. They're there like this. Wham! I grab and boom! I move in like that. I don't have to step into kiba. I need to maintain my balance for optimal power. And if stepping into kiba is not possible because your knees, I like the kiba movement here like this too. That's a great sweep, of course, but that's a different ball game to what I'm working on right now. I have a saying, write this down. You'll love it. It's mine. I know it's mine. It's original because I wrote it on the board in the dojo many years ago. A block is a lock, is a blow, is a throw. A block is a lock, is a blow, is a throw. What does that mean? It means every block you do can also be a lock and a blow and a throw. Every throw you do can also be a block and a lock. Okay? You need to expand your mind in terms of the kata bunkai so that everything is every possibility. A block is a lock, is a blow, is a throw. Here we're taught that this is a block. But that, can, that is also a tremendous tetsu, I mean, uh, here like this, someone comes in, you just go like that, can be a back fist, a knife hand into their temple or neck, okay? Block here. Two, there's a second movement. We grab that arm, we bring it underneath the arm, and I'm going to push, pull, pull that arm and strike the neck. From here, one. <laughs> Too, like that and you can see you get that nice explosion which sounds better if I make that funny noise by the way it makes me feel good when I go Poof! I learned that off Sheehan uh, Trevor Field when I was a little boy okay We're here there there I grab so now I'm working the hickey tear is an actual pull of their limb <clears throat> there like that and that tetsui or knife hand makes no difference <clears throat> right into their neck is a definite knockout blow. Again, same thing again. The guy's a tough guy. He's come in. I've moved off to this side this time. Same sort of thing. So now one, two, three, two, two, same thing. I grab that arm again and two, and I knock out that hand. So remember, the principle that I want you to take away from that first pin and two flow, we call it the flow, the series techniques flowing into each other. The attack comes off from the side. I move off to the side. I use this cover. One look, there's that cover there to cover my neck. And I reach under to grab his arm, and then <clears throat> I maintain a strong balance from there. What happens after that is up to you. But generally speaking, uh, you, you play it by ear as you go on from there. Okay, so that's a, an interesting interpretation out of pin and number two. Still sweating from those deck of cards. Let's have a look. Graham, awesome, tensor. Yes, very good. I will love another lesson on Kakato uh, Shihan. Yeah, good. You know, we'll work on that Kakato uh, Oroshi uh, when the, the uh, groups, I'll bring in a student, we'll work on that too. A block is a lock and a blow is a throw. A block, I'll write it, eh? A block is a lock, is 
a blow is a throw. Okay, a block is a lock, is a blow, is a throw. Remember that. That's uh, anyone, Daniel Langworthy, you may remember that. I've done it whenever I do seminars. It's one of the things that I like to highlight to people is that don't get yourself, as Bruce Lee said, don't get caught in the classical mess. Okay, well, the classical mess in karate is that when you do a kata, there is a set bunkai which you cannot deviate from. That's called the classical mess. That's the only thing you can't deviate from is uh, when you get caught in that classical mess. Uh, the reality is you need to uh, experiment, like so, so I said, of your own training, and that's very important. Uh, if we never have a conversation with our karate, we'll never learn to understand what, is trying, what it's trying to tell us. That's a great point and very eloquent. I think of Carter as karate trying to converse with me. Very good point. Mike's the author of that book, Shingi Tai. Okay, it's a very good point because so many people look at Carter as nothing more than a series of moves they have to do to get the next rank. And that's okay if, if your objective in training is to fight. Okay, and it's really very important that we understand that. Ask yourself, why am I training? Okay, when I was 19, 20, 21, I was really training for one thing, and that was to fight tournaments and be and you know be a bit of a tough guy. And then after tournaments, and it becomes a, a little bit different. Now I want to train fighters, but I still want to keep super fit. Okay, and then as you get older, your objective for training changes. So if you haven't really thought deeply about your cutter as a young man, when you get a little older. You start to feel as though there's nothing in karate for you. You say, ah, you know, I've, I've moved on from karate. I've moved in, you know, I'm doing CrossFit or whatever. I don't know. I mean, people are constantly looking for something new and they don't realize that everything they ever want is right there if they'll only take it a little bit deeper and peel the layer off the onion, okay? And you have to ask yourself, am I training to be fit? Am I training to be a fighting champion in tournaments? Very different to being a fighting champion uh, in real fighting okay or a street fighter and some i don't recommend going having fights but if you want to put yourself in a position where you're in the military or you're working doors and doing security a bodyguard anything like that if you can't fight with reality a sense of reality and if you can't handle the non-compliant opponent whose objective is to hurt you well then you're in for a shock and that includes tournament fighting i love tournament fighting because it's as close as you can get uh to testing your own body power and techniques without actually uh, breaking the law. You know, I mean, you go to a tournament, it's fantastic um, because it's an opportunity to test your technique. Some techniques, of course, you can't, okay? Sometimes you just train to get fit and improve your suppleness and flexibility. Well, if you do that, I mean, that's a really great reason to use kata. Kata, uh, they work your whole body. If you work a lot of those movements in correct motion, you pull your shoulder blades back. You wrap and you get this nice stretch across the body. You unwind and you're using your whole body with this arcs of tension across. Boom, closing, open, close, close, open up, open, close, open. Like this, all these movements, you get this constant beautiful flow of energy through the body that helps with your uh, youth and vitality, okay? Boy, oh, boy, run out of time again. I wanted to really work on a few interesting things. Pareto's Law, let's touch on that for a few minutes. Uh, you, may be, um, you may be familiar with Pareto's Law. It's often called the 80-20 rule. I think, I think um, Pareto was this Italian landowner or an Italian economist, I think, about two, 300 years ago. And he's the one that pointed out that he noticed that 20% of the landowners own 80% of the land. And he extrapolated that and realized that the principle holds true for virtually everything. And in karate, 20% of the techniques provides about 80% of anything you'll ever do. And you know that to be so because you look at tournament fighting, anyone who's had a good distinguished tournament career will know that generally speaking, every fight is pretty well a variation of a single theme you have a handful of techniques that you specialize in and the rest is just adaptation well that's the Pareto's law that of all the techniques you can use about 20 percent of them will give you about 80 percent of the benefit now 
I have a thing I call Core 54. What is the Core 54? If you've ever been to one of my seminars, you know, because I talk about it. And if you're a Patreon uh, supporter, and by the way, let me just give a little bit of a uh, shout out to all my Patreon family members. I really do appreciate it because it's the Patreon family that besides getting all the uh, extra benefits that they, 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 they get, uh, they're the ones that are actually helping me to be able to make these videos. So I really appreciate that. And I know I have some Patreon family right here now. And boy, oh boy, I really appreciate that anyone takes that commitment to a um, to uh, supporting my efforts. Thank you. But um, And the Core 54 is something that I'll be discussing with the Patreon members and uh, also seminar attendees. But the Core 54 is 54 techniques and concepts that I use, which I, I believe are the 20%, which will provide you 80% of what you'll ever need in training. Okay, so if you if you look at all the basics, 16 stances, 22 card of 30 basics, uh, and and the combination of those creates probably 250, 300 uh, fundamental keys that you need if you want to get anywhere uh, in Kyogushin. And probably more similarities than differences between other styles. So the similar rule holds. Okay, now my core 54 essentially is five main stances, the five main stances out of 16, which provide everything. And I guarantee if you went through all the uh, kata, all the stances come down to these five stances, okay? And and those stances are sanshin, zen kutsu, kokutsu, kibodachi, and the fighting stance, okay? Sanshin, zen kutsu dachi, kokutsu dachi, uh, kibodachi, and the fighting stance, those five. There are lots of other stances you can learn but they're the ones that everything centers around, okay? Then we have the five footwork patterns, okay? We've got the, uh, we've done those footwork patterns. You've got the circular sabaki motion, the uh, uh, the um, oyashi, which is, you know, the if you go left, lead with left, go right, lead with right, go forward, lead with the front foot, go foot back, lead with the back foot, or kuriyashi, or the shuffle, half and full shuffle, the kosaho, which is the switch movement, okay, and the split, what we call the split. So they're the five. So we've got five stances, five footwork patterns, eight hand techniques, four with the left hand, four with the right, eight kicks, and eight defensive motions or shapes. I call them defensive shapes. Eight defensive shapes for those eight punches, eight defensive shapes for those eight kicks. Now those eight kicks and eight punches will cover 90% of anything you'll ever anywhere. The other things... For a start, that if you're a tournament fighter, those eight kicks and eight punches will cover 90% of everything. So if you have in your training a fundamental body shape to defend those, well, then you've got 90% of your things covered. You're not having to guess and, oh, if he does that, what do I do? Oh, you you know, you already have it in your brain that when he throws that body roundhouse kick, it's elbow to hip. When he throws that thigh kick, it's knee out, body weight forward. When he throws that roundhouse kick, it's the cox comb with the takeaway. When he throws that body punch, it's the counter. You have eight defensive techniques for eight punches, eight defensive techniques for eight kicks. And that's 42 so far. Five stances, five footwork patterns, eight punches, eight kicks, eight defenses for the punches, eight defenses for the kicks. That's 42. Plus we have what we call the 12 support fundamentals which you have um the four somatics so the flexibility the speed the cardiovascular endurance and the strength and you have five impact drills so you have the hand makiwara the shin makiwara the um uh the what do they call the ab punches and the um uh uh the pummels we do a, a pummel drill which develops impact resistance against weight it's not so much that you're hardening your body against a hard punch like that it what it is is um uh, it's teaching you to resist by getting setting the body in the correct shape and that's that pummel drill so we have the shin conditioning on the makiwara the hand conditioning the makiwara the um two-man body conditioning uh what's that that's three the um uh the pummeling and the, uh, the thigh kick conditioning, they're the five. And then we have three more keys. Uh, I, I call them um, 
fundamental um, training keys, and that is you've got to develop your own primary go-to techniques. So as also I said, there is no Kyokushin. There's Cameron Karate, there's Paddy Karate, there's Daniel Karate. Uh, you have to take the techniques and make them fit your own um, lifestyle. And the next one is daily introspection. introspection. What, what does that mean? Daily introspection means learning how to even say that word. <laughs> daily introspection is something you can do on every level. It's not just um, one aspect. It, you can cover the whole Shingi Tai. So daily introspection is a really powerful, powerful tool away from the dojo as well. You sit down on the edge of your bed every night before you get in bed, you go, how did I do? Did I behave in a way that was correct? Did I behave... In a, in a way that my children would be proud of, okay? And in training, you do the same thing. At the end of training, you go, where did I go well? Where didn't I go well? Let me think about it. What can I do to improve so that when I go to training tomorrow, I have at least one key principle that I'm going to work on. I'm going to take that one key principle. It may be that I'm allowing my arms to come too wide and too far from my body. So I'm just trying to think of something off the top of my head. So what I'm going to do then is I go, okay, well, let me get my crosshairs in and my elbows and my hands in the correct position. And let me just focus on that for a little bit, okay? So it doesn't matter what that one principle can be. You, by reflecting on, by self-reflection on your training and on your attitude, that is one of the most powerful, powerful tools that you can use in your training. And number 54 of the core 54 is use a logbook. I can't emphasize a much, uh, any, as I can't emphasize too much how important I think that is. I have logbooks going back to 1980. I have logbooks actually 1979, 1980. Uh, I kept the logbook in 1984 when I was in Uchi Deshi with Soulside, keeping notes. Uh, I keep notes all the years that I've been interpreting for Solsai. Um, I have kept notes of those conversations because I find very interestingly that these people, which I may be, but there's one thing I haven't done and that's I haven't ever forgotten the content of a conversation with Solsai, particularly when I write it down. Okay, so for your training, um, use a logbook. Uh, I'm not trying to sell you my logbook, but I have, um, I'm now getting printed right now. Um, a fantastic dojo logbook. It doesn't matter. Look, you can use a notepad, but what you want to do is during your period of introspection about your training, you keep a note and you make a note and you can take that note to your instructor and ask instructor and ask questions. Okay. And Mike said, some people want to go far. Budo points you towards going deep. Well, that's true. An inch, an inch wide and a mile deep is much better than a mile wide and an inch deep. Okay, and well, I shouldn't say that because there is a place for people who do a mile wide and inch deep. Usually, actors. If you want to be a good actor, um, you don't necessarily. You know, you look at people like Jason Statham. He's like, his technique is fantastic, and he has a broad range of techniques. But would he last the first round in a Kyokushin World Tournament? Uh, I don't think so. Um, he might surprise me and, he's, you know, if he's as tough as his persona on the movies is, well, then he will surprise me. And every now and then you get great uh, actors like Michael Jai White who are legitimate Kokushin um, fighters, you know, so there's that too. But as Mike says, it, the, the Budo takes you deep and that's what you should do. You should – You Saulsai said that the, the quest for perfection never ends and – even as even uh, his daughter once told me that he walked, she walked in and he's lying in bed just staring at his fist and he looked up and giggled. He said, you know, even after 60 years, I don't know whether I've even mastered the fundamental fist, you know. So that's the depth of it. Harry, thank you for today's session. For more understanding what I was asking. Oh, good on you. Yes. Um, by all means, those up kicks are great. And, look, I didn't even get... <laughs> I talk too much. But as long as we get that hard session out of the way first, we have a bit of a sweat, then we can relax together. Solsai, one of the most important things that Solsai taught me was train first, talk later, okay, because if you talk first, you never train later. Train first, get a good sweat up, then talk later, and you can talk uh, from a voice of experience. You haven't tried to kid anyone, okay? So I'll keep a lot of 
what I was going to do today till next time. Um, I wanted to look at some really fantastic solo drills that you can use uh, in your solo training while we're in this lockdown, um, different ways to train at home, you know, and one of them is that core 54 having the fundamental defensive shapes for the eight kicks and eight punches. Well, that's simply a matter of having all the body parts in the right place at the right time, okay? And Shingi Tai, you can use that Shingi Tai very, very easily in your personal training. Shin, the mind, a little bit of meditation every day. If you don't like to meditate, just sit and say, uh, take a couple of breaths, watch the breath go in and out. Gi technique. Okay, well, that's simply a matter of working on that concept of core 54, having all the body parts in the right place at the right time. So when you're working alone, use your visualization. What would I do if he throws that front kick? Bang, bang, roundhouse kick, bang, body kick, defense against the jab, slip. Uh, you can do all that uh, in your personal training for the gi part of shingi tai. And tai, of course, body, well, that's body conditioning. And the two main areas, well, there's four main areas of body conditioning. What are they? Cardiovascular endurance, flexibility, strength, and speed. So you can work all four of those alone. And Richard Kimmy keeps catching himself wanting to do kumite with the young ones 50 years younger. Don't worry, you get over that soon enough. <laughs> all you need is a wonky knee like mine and the desire to uh, train with people 50 years younger tends to dissipate fairly quickly. So everybody, thank you again. Uh, Alan's asking, will this be in my book? You know, I have two books. I have my reprint of the, the second edition of my book, uh, The Budo Karate of Masayama, and that's due out July 27, the anniversary of Saul Sai's birthday. <clears throat> and right now my daughter, who's uh, she does um, online, she's a, what do they call it, um, information technology designer. So she designs web pages and stuff. She's down where you are, Patty. She's at, doing her last semester at Swinburne University. But anyway, she's designing the web page. We're getting the orders up. We're going to do a pr as soon as that one is finished. I've already written another one, uh, which is essentially a collection of all my training principles. So yes, Andrew, I have all of that in the second book, which will be coming out later in the in the year. And it's very possible uh, that the printing production on the log books will be done before even the Budo Karate is published. But anyway, that's some exciting news. I'm pretty excited about it. And the, the new opportunity for research to, to um, fill in some of the holes that I was left with with my book has been fantastic. So originally I was just going to reprint the book, but now it's a, a completely new second edition with um, a lot more really solid historical information as well as uh, uh, training information. Principle training information. The second book is a book on um, training. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, guys. I love that everybody came along again. Uh, we went 20 minutes over time today, but we still have uh, people on board, and I really appreciate that. I hope you got something out of it. Please leave a message underneath. What happens is when it goes live, you're you're able to leave a message underneath as well. Please leave one there so I know. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Was. おし、神の日ありがとうございます。たとても。神の日ありがとうございます。日本からも来てるんですよね。ゲーハブブルフロムフロムスウェーデンオフロムノーウェイです。アンプリシュアゲーズフロムノーウェイアクチュアリ。ク
and I'll get to them later on. Let's, 